Hey everybody, we are looking for medical students to join our Curbsiders team with an application deadline of Friday, April 10th, 2020. Let's hear from Hannah and Beth for more details. Hi, I'm Hannah R. Abrams. I'm an MS4 who runs the Curbsiders Twitter account. And I'm Beth Garbs Garbatelli, a rising MS3 who runs the Instagram account for the Curbsiders. So being a part of the Curbsiders team for both of us has just been this incredible opportunity to learn from the community and the conversation that happens around each episode. Yeah, I've really found that each episode is sort of a chance to deep dive into a clinical topic. So on top of how much fun you have working with the team, a lot of fun. I also get a chance to learn and to learn a lot too. Um, and that's why we're putting out this call for applications to join the team. Um, we're really interested in bringing on pre-medical or medical students who are looking to expand their clinical and podcasting skill set, or in curbsider speak, students who are looking for a little podcasting knowledge food for their brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> We'd really be interested in hearing from folks who have a specific interest in video editing, website development, or Instagram. So if you're interested in joining, send a CV and a half page about who you are, why you're a good fit for our team to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Feel free to include any social media handles, and we can't wait to see what you come up with. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly Cash Like More Hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. So uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, as always, Paul, this feels totally natural to be doing a live podcast. A hundred percent. You guys fill up a room nicely, so strong work. Yeah. Mayo, thank you for having us. Right. So uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction as well. So uh, we are the Curbsiders. I'm Matt, Stuart, and Paul. And Paul, for I think maybe some of these people haven't heard the show before. So do you want to tell them just like briefly, like maybe a little mission statement from the show? Sure. You guys heard a little bit before. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. There are no others that <laughs> use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. For those of you who have not heard, basically we're three people who use a very public forum to fill in our knowledge gaps. So we ask people much smarter than us to sort of teach us about stuff that we don't feel comfortable with. And then we record it and kind of put it out into the world um, for better, for worse. Um, and today, should we talk about our guest? Yeah, why don't you tell them about our guest and let's let's get started. So today we have the good fortune to talk to someone you, hopefully you know well, Dr. Kerry Thompson. We're going to be talking about the approach to lymphadenopathy. Dr. Thompson is an associate professor of medicine and the APD for the Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program at the Mayo Clinic where she has completed her internal medicine residency and a fellowship in hematology oncology. This is where I usually pause for cheap heat so you guys can applause at your home institution. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Perfect. I, I, I appreciate it. This, this way, people listening at home will know this is actually a live thing. We're not just making this up. Um, so, finished her fellowship in hematology oncology. Also has a master's in clinical epidemiology and health services research from Weill Connell Medical College. Clinical research interests are focused in hematologic cancers, such as lymphoma, including quality of life and long-term issues in survivors. And so, without further ado, we are thrilled to be able to talk to Dr. Thompson today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. And Dr. Thompson, is is it okay if we call you Carrie for the remainder of the podcast? Yes. Keeping it cash here? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, let's, uh, let's get... We're going to spend a couple minutes to get to know you. These will be rapid-fire questions. So, first question... Can you tell the audience a one-liner about yourself and maybe include a hobby outside of medicine? Of course. I'm a mid-career hematologist here at Mayo. I'm a mom to three kids, a set of twins who are nine and an 11-year-old. My husband's a Mayo physician as well. In my free time, besides shuttling kids around, I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy cooking, exercising, and watching American Idol. So my, I'll ask my usual question as I amass a further backlog of books that I just haven't gotten around to reading yet, but I know that you're excited about a specific book recommendation. So please tell us about a book that every physician should read. I love the book entitled In Shock by Dr. Audish. For those of you who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, she is a physician herself, an excellent writer, and tells the story of her own experience as a patient and has lessons on patient-physician communication and the uh, patient experience that really transcends any specialty. What's your, uh, what's your favorite failure, patient complaint, or something memorable, and what did you learn from that? 
Okay, I will tell you about a recent uh, favorite patient complaint. Uh, so I saw... Yeah, yes, 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 HIPAA compliant. Yes, a cash lack. Uh, so this patient I was seeing for anemia, and uh, she had a pan-positive review of systems, uh, including losing uh, multiple teeth in the last year, and her teeth were breaking. I was like, well, this is interesting. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to help this long list of review of systems. But as I was asking about um, questions related to anemia, looking for nutritional deficiencies, I asked about pica symptoms. I said, so do you uh, crave any unusual things like ice? And she looked at me and said, did my mother tell you? I said, I don't know what you're (laughs) talking about. Uh, But apparently she was um, getting these giant um, cups of ice from Sonic and eating them nonstop to the point that she broke three teeth in the in a period of a six month six months. And so um, sure enough, her ferritin was three. She got (laughs) she got IV iron and came back um, very, very happy that I fixed her teeth. How do you feel about that, Paul? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We don't have any time for Iron Man, Stuart. Let's go on to uh, if a quick piece of advice. What's what's some great advice you've gotten along the way in your career that you'd like to share share with the audience here? Um, I think as a learner, the best advice I received as a third year medical student was from a pediatrician. And every day we had to justify, why did you order this test? And so if we ordered a CBC, it was, well, did you really need the platelets or you were just looking at their hemoglobin? So to that level of detail and taught me that you really have to think about every single test that you order, have a reason for why you're getting it. Uh, And that has stuck with me throughout my career. Yeah, that practice needs to become more widespread. I, I would I would love that. Okay. So let's let's move into a case from Cash Lack. Uh and this is definitely a real name. Uh James Lumpy Man is a forty 40- this so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh James Lumpy Man is a forty five year old white male with type two diabetes. He takes metformin, he's got high blood pressure, he's on lisinopril, he has gout on allopurinol, and he's coming in the primary care office. He's noticed that he's got a lump in his groin. Uh, he's not had any weight loss, fevers, drenching night sweats. He hasn't noticed any other sites with enlarged lymph nodes, but he also admits he's not exactly been feeling around for them. So we're going to talk all about Mr. Lumpy Man, but uh, can you first remind us, like, why why exactly do we have a lymphatic system? It's been a really long time since uh, medical school when I, when I thought a lot about this. Yeah, it's kind of a forgotten system, right? Uh, so there's two main um things that the lymphatic system does. One is it returns our fluid from uh, the organs back to the cardiovascular system. And then it's also a very integral part of the immune system. So the lymphocytes uh, are developed and blood is filtered through the through all of these organs. There's uh, six main organs of the lymphatic system. We've got our bone marrow, the thymus, which um, involutes during adolescence, but is um, really important during childhood for the maturation of the immune system. We've got the lymph nodes, um, the spleen, the tonsils, and then the Peyer's patches, which are areas of uh, lymphatic tissue within the GI, um, GI tract. And the uh, lymph nodes are connected via um, the lymphatic uh, uh, system, and so it goes everywhere in the body. So let's uh, specifically talk about this patient here. So he's 45. He's got an enlarged inguinal lymph node. It helps to have a differential diagnosis when thinking about these things. So what kind of framework do you use to approach uh, lymphadenopathy in general? Yeah, lymphadenopathy is very common. And most lymphadenopathy is not caused by malignancy. I think that's what we're all concerned about. But in fact, of those who go to their primary care physicians who have lymphadenopathy, 95% of the time it's benign. So it's really important to have a framework to think about what else could it be. Um, And I really like Miami. It helps us remember all of the different uh, etiologies of adenopathy. So M is malignancy. It's the one that we think of the most. Um, That can be a hematological malignancy. We're talking about lymph nodes, of course, lymphoma, leukemia, but also um, metastases from, from other cancers can certainly cause lymphadenopathy. I is for infection, which is probably um, the most common cause of lymphadenopathy. And that can be any kind of organism, bacterial, granulomatous, viral, fungal, tick-borne, really anything. 
Um, A is one that's forgotten, but I would say is also quite common, um, autoimmune. So autoimmune diseases cause an inflammatory response within the body that can cause enlargement of the lymph nodes, so rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, etc., Stills disease. Um, M is for miscellaneous because we had to have something for the M. Um, <laughs> and so Castleman's disease fits into that one, sarcoidosis. Um, and then I is iatrogenic. Um, and medications is really the, the thing that fits into this category. It's unusual, but there are some drugs that can can cause a response. Uh, phenytoin is, is kind of the classic example, but there's many other drugs that have been reported to cause lymphadenopathy. So allopurinol, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, penicillin, Bactrim, things this, that we use every day. This was not on my radar at all. Like I had, I had never heard of this before. Mr. Lumpy Man is taking allopurinol. <laughs> uh, so at, my question about that is, I guess with this mnemonic in general and then with medications, is this mnemonic more for like generalized adenopathy um, or certain parts of it? Uh, and then as far as medications, would that cause generalized adenopathy more than local? That's what I would think. But Yeah, I, I would think of anything that's kind of systemic. So like autoimmune conditions, that's a systemic disorder. Sure. That's going to cause generalized adenopathy. Um, medication, same thing would cause a generalized reaction versus um, infection may just be a localized depending on if it's, you know, somebody who has a respiratory infection, upper respiratory infection, they may just have cervical adenopathy because that's the area of lymph nodes that drain that part of the body. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, there comes a time when you're evaluating patients where then you have to talk to them. Um, <laughs> Because it's the diagnosis has not declared itself yet. Like he gave us the diagnosis of lymph node, which is great. That's a good start, but not enough, Mr. Lumpy Man. So when we're <laughs> when we're talking to the patient, sort of taking a history about uh, lymphadenopathy in general, is there again going back to sort of frameworks and sort of how you approach these things? Is there a way that you sort of think about asking about a history for someone who comes in with either multiple or just a single um, lymph node and yeah, you know, on there. Yeah, absolutely. Because the the differential is so broad, I think you have to have a framework to to keep in mind, you know, how am I going to sort out this this patient issue? And so all ages is one that you can use to uh, help you think about what you're paying attention to in your history and and your exam. So A, age. Um, Malignancies are more common the older patients get. Um, with the exception of lymphoproliferative disorders, they can affect people of all ages, but certainly like solid tumors, they're much more common as, as um, patients get older. Um, L is location. So that's, that's in particular important for um, a localized lymphadenopathy. Where is that lymphadenopathy? Because knowing the drainage patterns within the body can help help you sort out where the, the primary issue may be coming from. I use the example of an upper respiratory infection, cervical lymphadenopathy, for example. Um, L, length of time present. So this is really important to um, understand. Is this something I can watch or is this something I really need to investigate? Most reactive lymph nodes will run their course and disappear within a period of about two weeks. So we say if something, if a lymph node has been um, enlarged and is still present after four to six weeks, that's where you're going to want to take the next step in testing. Um, a, associated signs and symptoms. So again, because the differential is broad, you want to know, does the patient have fever? Are they having drenching night sweats? Have they lost weight? Um, are, do they have a cough? You know, those kinds of things um, that can help you um, sort out what's going on. Arthralgias, r rash, etc. G is generalized versus localized. And we kind of got got to that um, just earlier. Generalized is usually a more systemic uh, issue or could be a lymphoma that involves more than one area or a widely metastatic uh, cancer. E is extranodal associations. I think this is fairly similar to the associated signs and symptoms, but again, we needed an E in the mnemonic. So. <laughs> Cramming it in there. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd have too many consonants All and none. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then S, S is splenomegaly, um, which can be associated with lymphomas, of course, leukemias, uh, but also remember um, mono, so uh, infectious mononucleosis caused by EBV, very common cause of particularly cervical lymphadenopathy in the younger population and can be associated with splenomegaly as well.
Yep. And a uh, Miami that's really good for all ages is actually Miami Vice. So, <laughs> hope to hammer that one home. Again, insanely helpful. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Well, uh, Carrie, you had you had mentioned. I know you had a couple like mini cases that you wanted to talk about. So, can you tell us like an example of where it was really important to take a good history uh, in a patient with adenopathy? Yeah, I can tell you about this great um, case of a woman that we saw in the uh, lymphoma clinic uh, came to us with query lymphoma. So her history was um, that she was a 65 year old woman who had a known sarcoma a couple years prior. So she was monitored by her oncologist and was doing well until she developed inguinal lymphadenopathy, which of course worried her. She went back to see her oncologist and they did a needle biopsy. The biopsy showed some abnormal T cells and concerning for T cell lymphoma. So she got sent um, to see us as her oncologist was a sarcoma uh, specialist. Um, And We decided, well, we need more tissue, so we got um, an excisional lymph node biopsy, which did not show lymphoma. It showed reactive changes. We had a PET scan, which showed um, adenopathy kind of in the pelvis as well as the inguinal region, so we were quite concerned. Whole bunch of labs, really nothing was was, uh, helpful in terms of the workup. We treated her like a fever of unknown origin as she was having some low-grade fevers, and sent her to infectious diseases to help us out as um, they are smarter than we are sometimes. They got a great exposure history. Um, This uh, woman had gotten a new kitten a few months prior. And... (laughs) And I, I'm just a matter of time between Paul and Stuart. They have nine cats or seven cats, something we were talking about. One of them is going to get this at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so I, not, not to take up too much time. So as we're sitting here knowing the punchline of the story, and then you say pet scan and also having a constitutional hatred of puns, <laughs> but realizing that's a great one and just kind of keep it. I went through a whole journey during that story, so I just wanted to thank you for that. You, you guys were a witness to it. Her, her, her initials are cat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So really high yield stuff. Take that, put it in your back pocket, carry it with you. I, if you don't mind, if I could go back and ask. So for this patient, you, you, the patient that you just described has the history of sarcoma. So for me, as someone who admittedly doesn't know anything, you have a little bit of a scary history and someone presents with some lymphadenopathy, I would lose my mind quietly, hopefully not externally. But I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just sort of touching on sort of red flags or what in the initial history should be particularly alarming, or is there a location that really would kind of sort of set you off in a more worrisome kind of direction? Yeah, absolutely. So um, age, I already mentioned, was, you know, the older a patient is, the more concerning that um, there's a malignancy. Um, And 40 is used as a cutoff, which uh, to me feels quite young. Um, (laughs) But it is a differentiator where 4% of uh, patients over the age of 40 with lymphadenopathy will have a malignancy. And of course, that percentage goes up over time. Uh, The length of time present, I mentioned that four to six week cutoff, um, generalized tends to be more concerning than localized because localized is oftentimes an infectious etiology that will get better on its own. Uh, Male versus female, um, I don't know if this is because uh, men tend to have lymphoma more than women, that may be the case. They just don't go to Um, to the doctor as much. uh, That's true too. Uh, The supraclavicular uh, location is also a, a red flag because that uh, pattern of drainage is of the lungs, the GI tract, and the GU system. And so um, you can't explain supraclavicular lymphadenopathy based on an upper respiratory infection. Um, systemic symptoms, of course, you know, if somebody has uh, 20 pounds weight loss asso- associated with this, that's going to be concerning. Uh, and then white race um, was also identified in a retrospective study as a risk factor for malignancy. So those are my red flags. So every time I examine a patient with lymphadenopathy, I, I hope I'm doing it right. I'm not, I'm not sure. I just pray they don't have supraclavicular adenopathy. I'm like, please don't feel anything there. But can you tell us, can you walk us through a little bit about how you approach the physical exam and which sites to pay attention to um, just to make sure yeah. the audience knows? Yeah, this is, this is so important because the lymph node exam is missed or not performed 
a lot of the time. And it's it's because it's hard. It's not part of the usual heart lungs, um, but it's a skill that takes practice. And like anything, it's a skill that you get better at with time. So my first piece of advice is just make it part of the routine physical exam um, so that you're actually looking for adenopathy. I've seen a lot of patients who are referred after a um, scan will show lymphadenopathy and you palpate and you're like, wow, this, this patient has a five centimeter axillary node that hasn't been picked up on just wow. because the exam hasn't happened. Um, so I always examine cervical. I kind of, you know, do my routine. So cervical uh, lymph nodes, then I do the supraclavicular, um, axillary, then inguinal. You're not going to be pal- able to palpate anything in terms of the hilar intra-abdominal lymph nodes unless they're they're very, very large. But those are the palpable areas. And as long as you're checking, then you should be able to palpate anything that's greater than about one or 1.5 centimeters. And if you can palpate it, that means that's abnormal. It seems like from, from my reading that e- even though there's certain features of what you might feel on exam that none of those can really say for sure, like, this is not malignancy, or this is malignancy. But can you talk about like, how you think about that? Like when you're when you're feeling a palpable lymph node? Yeah, so there, there aren't any signs on exam that can that are definitives to say malignant versus reactive. Certainly, if a node is hard and fixed, that's more suggestive of a malignancy. Um, And we think of tender means inflammatory, and that's more likely to be an infectious process. But that's not always true, because anything that stretches that lymph node capsule will cause that tenderness. And so a rapidly growing um, cancer will cause that same feeling. Um, And even many cancers will feel soft or rubbery to the touch. So they, they, it doesn't give you great information. There is the shoddy adenopathy though. Um, if, if you've heard that term, that, sure. that re- I don't know what it means, but I've heard it. <laughs> I just nodded real aggressively. <laughs> do not know what shoddy is. <laughs> so shoddy, um, is a term that is meant to, um, meant for you to think of like little buckshots, um, like the actual little oh, yeah. BBs. We're big hunters, all of us. Yeah, oh, maybe yeah, yeah. So think of like <laughs> the little Texas. BBs. <laughs> so it's they're hard, they're firm, they're small. They're generally like a pea-sized or smaller. They should be freely mobile. Um, fairly common to palpate these. They're they're generally of no clinical concern. They generally are there for long periods of time and don't change. So for the audience, I have to. This is a little peek behind the curtain, how great we follow the, the script. That's the reason why I'm having to like go back and forth. <laughs> so it happens to be that next portion of our script is actually ask about laboratory workup. So uh, what labs would you say are pertinent to the initial workup for lymphadenopathy? What things can we uh, maybe avoid ordering? Yeah, so I'm a hematologist. I love the CBC and CBC with differential, please. Um, And the differential, because you want to know if there's a leukocytosis, the white count's elevated, what kind of white cells are elevated? So in a young, younger individual, you're thinking mononucleocytosis. Mono. Uh, (laughs) There you go. You're a pro. I got this podcast thing down. Um, (laughs) You would expect that their lymphocytes are elevated, for example, versus bacterial. The the neutrophils will be elevated. Peripheral smear can be helpful as well. Um, And then it depends on those other associated signs and symptoms, you know, as you've taken your history with all ages as as your background background. So ANA can be helpful, screening for autoimmune conditions, HIV. Sometimes I do check other viral serologies, EBV, CMV. Um, tuberculosis would be in your in your um, differential depending on the patient population, exposures and such. And then of course the monospot. Uh, there are times, for example, if you had a hunter who is coming in after they've been out in the woods in the fall in Minnesota, we would be thinking about tick-borne illnesses. And so you may expand your, your um, serologies um, depending on the patient. And uh, audience, please do not order an ANA on Mr. Lumpy Man with like one swollen <laughs> lymph node. Like, please like think about uh, ordering the ANA. Uh, I always am hesitant to order an ANA until I think I like am forced into doing it uh, because then you get the patient with like the one to 40 ANA positive that's telling everyone they have lupus for the rest of their life, uh, which I think we've probably all seen. All right. So you mentioned to me, we had talked offline 
flow cytometry. So I, this is not a test I typically order. I think it's above my pay grade, mostly because I don't understand exactly what it is or when I should order it. So can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes. Thank you for bringing this up. This is um, one of my pet peeves. Oh yeah. Well, and, it's going to be good. Let's, okay. let's hear All it. All right. Here we go. Let them have it. So flow cytometry is a test that can be done on many different types of tissue, but we're talking about ordering it as a blood test. So done on peripheral blood and it's Uh, phenotyping the cells, you're looking at the lymphocytes in particular. So it is tempting to say, oh, somebody has lymphadenopathy. That's something abnormal. So I should do a test on the lymphocytes in the blood because those things are related. Um, But lymphadenopathy, if it's related to a hematology diagnosis, most likely it's going to be lymphoma. That's a cancer of the lymph nodes, the tissue. It generally is not Um, have circulating cells in the bloodstream. So if your patient, you've got your CBC, you've got your differential, if the lymphocyte count is normal, then there is no sense doing a peripheral blood flow cytometry because it's an expensive test and it's very unlikely to yield a diagnosis. If the issue is the lymph node that's enlarged, you need to get your diagnosis from that tissue that's abnormal, not the blood. Clear. So that's very helpful. Yeah, if I'm ordering flow cytometry, it's a Hail Mary pass and things are not going well. So that's that's really helpful. Um, so what about imaging? So if, if you wouldn't mind speaking to when do you decide to pull the trigger on imaging? And then are there a preferred modalities? There's sort of ultrasonography is all the rage right now. But when do you do ultrasound versus a CT scan? Yeah, so I would think of the patient that I've made a decision, okay, I'm not going to observe this patient. They have either they have generalized adenopathy, um, and that's gen, you know usually a concern. I'm going to do some further workup. They have red flag um, symptoms. They've lost 30 pounds. They have supraclavicular adenopathy, and they have a 50-pack year smoking history with a new cough. You know, I'm concerned about that. Uh, generally, CT scan is uh, better than an ultrasound in adults um, to really get the lay of the land. Is the adenopathy present in just the area that you can palpate? Or, you know, for the example I just gave, does that patient have an abnormality within his lungs, the hilar lymph nodes, mediastinal, et cetera? Um, I would not jump right to a PET scan. That would be that would be too much. Um, in terms of ultrasound, ultrasound can be helpful for guiding if you're making the choice to do a needle biopsy. And we can talk about biopsies. We definitely will talk about biopsies that, yeah. coming up. Um, uh, and they're helpful to uh, avoid radiation in children. So that is the the um, recommended modality in kids. But in adults, generally a, a CT scan is the best. So to kind of recap what we've talked about so far, so our, our, our patient, Mr. Lumpy Man, um, he's, he's coming to us. He's only noticed one lymph node. It's an inguinal lymph node. Um, and let's say we haven't really notified, we, we've done our, we've thought about Miami as our differential diagnosis. We've sort of asked the questions that go along with all ages. And he's an older, uh, he's an older male, so that is sort of a little bit of a red flag, I guess. But he's got an inguinal lymph node. And, uh, based on our history, let's just say we ordered a CBC, but we didn't think he qualified for an ANA. We didn't think he had TB risk factors, uh, didn't seem like he had mono. So we're proceeding. Um, well, we've, we, we've examined him now and, uh, well, well, so Paul will get on with the case and, and I guess, but that's, that's pretty much where we'd be at. We would have done an exam. We would have done this and the exam for his case is going to lead us forward. So now, God help us, we've talked to the patient, we've actually examined the patient, we're doing fantastic work. So we examined Mr. Lumpy Man, he has bilateral, non-tender, slightly firm inguinal lymphadenopathy, the largest node is about two centimeters, and also you find axillary lymphadenopathy on examination too, with a node measuring at least a centimeter and a half. So in other words, we are now, we've progressed from sort of local lymphadenopathy to, I guess we're in the, the territory of unexplained generalized lymphadenopathy. So I guess even before we kind of get into where to go from here, I think you alluded to this earlier. If a patient comes in with swollen lymph nodes, the concern is for them is probably malignancy. They're sort of convinced that they have cancer until you prove it otherwise. So how do you how do you counsel patients, or how do you sort of start the conversation before you begin the workup? Yeah, I think um, I use tell them the facts in in terms of you know I am concerned about 
malignancy as a possibility, but there are so many other things that can cause your, your lymph nodes to, in, to be enlarged, including infections, autoimmune conditions, etc. And so we want to be thorough and work up these other things. Um, but finding a diagnosis of cancer, of course, we don't want to miss that. And that's why in Mr. Lumpy Man, who has generalized adenopathy, he's um, of the age, he's 45, I believe, which is um, young in my book, but in the all ages, that's above the age of mm-hmm. a cutoff where we'd be, we would be concerned. Um, and he's got multiple areas that, that are enlarged. I would tell him that I would like to proceed with a biopsy uh, to rule out uh, malignancy. And if it was just, let's say, a patient uh, with just like a single cervical node or just like a, an inguinal node of like a centimeter or something like that, and nothing about the history or else about the exam, what, how would you counsel someone that you're going you're gonna to let them go for a while and come back? Like, what does that conversation sound like? Yeah, that's a lot of reassurance because uh-huh. the chances of finding a, a cancer is quite low in that situation, particularly inguinal um, adenopathy is is the area that's most common to have lymphadenopathy in adults, um, particularly in summertime when people walk barefoot because the inguinal nodes drain the lower extremities. And so very common to have, um, you know, antigens entering the body and you get a little bit of a reaction. Uh, so those patients, it's a lot of reassurance. Um, but to do due diligence, I would say, why don't you come back and somewhere in that four to six week uh, mark to ensure that new symptoms haven't developed, new new lymph nodes haven't developed, and that that um, area of concern has uh, resolved. Reading about this, like a lot of the time it would say an FNA, like a fine needle aspiration can be just fine. I know core needle biopsy is a possibility. And then there's the excisional biopsy. I know you're biased ahead of time, but can you talk about like how does the how does what we get from each of those differ, and why is why do you prefer one over the other? Yeah, the the biggest difference in the those three different modalities is the amount of tissue that you're getting to the pathologist. So a fine needle aspirate is really um, a small uh, piece of tissue where they can look at the cells, um, but that's about about it. On a core needle biopsy, it's still performed with a needle, but it's a much larger needle. And so you can get a, a, an idea of the histopathology, what the cells look like next to each other a little bit better. Um, but on an excisional biopsy, you get the whole architecture of the lymph node. And for lymphomas, uh, for example, that that architecture of the lymph node can be very helpful because certain lymphomas will grow in different patterns within the lymph node. And there's over 60 different types of lymphoma. So having as much tissue um, as, as, as we can for the pathologist to really make that diagnosis is helpful. Another example, good example of... Um, where this is useful is if you're suspecting Hodgkin lymphoma. It tends to happen more in younger individuals, but the malignant cells, which are the Reed Sternberg cells, those owl eye guys, um, they're the minority. They're only it's like vaguely familiar to me. Yeah. I, yeah. Between that and Pyre's patches, this is really yeah. a dumb memory. Like, <laughs> <Yeah. this has laughs> <been. laughs> bringing you back. Um, but those Reed Sternberg cells are only one to five percent of the actual cells within that enlarged lymph node because they recruit all these inflammatory cells. So if you're just getting a, a fine needle aspirate or even a core needle biopsy, it's easy to mistake a patient with Hodgkin lymphoma as having a reactive uh, process, um, or if you have a really angry. Um, looking lymph node, and you don't have the full architecture, it may be hard to rule out malignancy. So that's why we always, if you're thinking of a hematology diagnosis like lymphoma, excisional lymph node biopsy, particularly if there's something that's palpable, is the best um, best way to go when you're making an initial diagnosis. And is there ever a situation where you would actually choose FNA over a uh, excisional biopsy? Yeah, so sometimes if we have patients that we're not we're not sure. It's somebody like the gentleman with a cough who's a 50 pack year smoking history and a supraclavicular lymph node and let's say cervical lymph nodes too. That patient I'm thinking has a higher likelihood of a lung cancer, let's say, or a head and neck cancer. Um, and so an FNA can give you the cytology and can tell you adenocarcinoma versus 
non-diagnostic or maybe looks like lymphoma. And that may be helpful if the patient is headed towards a surgical resection, for example, as then they're not healing from an excisional biopsy. It just makes it easier for the surgeon. Can you talk about like the choice of where to biopsy and how maybe imaging factors into that as well? Yeah, the the rule is the largest lymph node is generally going to yield the diagnosis. So the largest palpable lymph node would be your node of choice to biopsy. And if you have, let's say, equal size lymph nodes in the inguinal region and the axillary region, you would go with the axillary because inguinal um, reactive lymphadenopathy is common. Um, So we do use imaging to help guide us. There are times when um, somebody has lymphadenopathy and none of it's palpable or it's really small, but they've got large nodes that are in the hyalur region, let's say, or or in the mesentery. And then a, a core needle biopsy may be your um, best um, shot at getting something, uh, getting a diagnosis without putting the patient through a surgical procedure. So we sometimes will forego an excisional biopsy if we can make the diagnosis when it's not palpable. So I guess back to Mr. Back to Mr. Lumpy Man here for this, from what we've told you here, he's got, so he's got axillary and inguinal lymphadenopathy. So from what you just said, we'd be going after an excisional biopsy of the axillary lymph nodes. We're worried enough that this could be malignant or malignancy or lymphoma. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And I guess practically speaking, um, does it matter if you refer to for the actual excision, like IR versus surgery, or is that institution specific? I think that's institution specific. Okay. Yeah. So can you, uh, can you tell us about another, like, I know, I know you had another case, uh, that kind of illustrates some of this. This was someone with more of a generalized yeah. adenopathy. Yeah. This was another great, um, great example of keep your differential broad. Remember that Miami, that not all is M malignancy. You've got to think about the other, other, um, scenarios. So this was a patient that we were called to see on the hematology inpatient consult service, um, woman who presented to the ER with fevers, night sweats, feeling very uh, poorly for about two weeks and abdominal pain. So in the ER, she got um, an abdominal CT and it showed splenomegaly and generalized lymphadenopathy. And with these B symptoms, the radiologist wrote very suspicious for lymphoma. She got admitted uh, to the floor. We were called to see her and Digging into the history just a bit, we noticed that she had a mechanical um, valve and had a new murmur that had not been documented prior. And so sure enough, we do the infectious workup, blood cultures come positive very quickly, she has endocarditis. And so the lymphadenopathy in the splenomegaly was just her body doing exactly what it was supposed to do, which is respond to a uh, bacteremia endocarditis. Yeah, wow. Well, I, we are going to leave time for audience questions. So maybe, uh, Carrie, you can give a little bit of your, you can give your take home points and then we can do some audience questions, um, about lymphadenopathy. And then, uh, after the fact, uh, we can always answer other specific questions. Like we'll be, we'll be hanging around a little bit after, but I know we have a hard out here, um, coming up. So, yeah, great. So my take home points on a uh, workup of Mr. Lumpy Man or any patient of with lymphadenopathy is that first of all, ma- most patients who are in the primary care setting with lymphadenopathy are not going to have cancer. That is, that is a very small, less than 5% of patients. So think about that broad differential and remember Miami as a way to think through that, that uh, differential infection and autoimmune conditions are, are quite common. Common. Uh, talk to your patients when in doubt. Be at the bedside. Get that uh, get that exposure history. Um, use all ages as a nice way to work through all of those different pieces of the history that can help lead you to a diagnosis. And when a biopsy is necessary, if you have lymphoma in the differential, please get an excisional lymph node biopsy uh, as your pathologist will be able to really help make a diagnosis uh, rather than just get a suspicious finding that leads you to do another biopsy and then another biopsy. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Stuart's going to come into the audience. Oh, no, actually, we're not going to do that. We're, we have a microphone 
that will come into the audience. Just we will repeat the questions just so that they can be uh, when we put this out as a podcast, uh, they can be on the actual recording as well. So if people have questions for Dr. Thompson, please raise your hands and we can come around and get you a mic. Are we going to do the pet before or after? I see. So if I'm understanding the question, is it useful to use the PET scan to actually localize the correct lymph node to biopsy? Am I understanding? Perfect. Yeah, so great question. I would uh, say standard of care would not would be to not to do a PET scan beforehand. Um, generally, you're going to have a different form of imaging already, usually a CT scan that can help inform what's the, based on the size of the lymph node where you're going to biopsy. Um, a PET scan will um, give the patient additional radiation, additional cost, et cetera. Um, that being said, if a patient then has a diagnosis of a malignancy that is PET avid, then they will likely get a PET scan afterwards as part of staging, but it wouldn't be considered standard of care as workup for lymphadenopathy before you have a diagnosis of malignancy. Yep. I've got a question for you. Does anyone know what this is? Oh, not that one <laughs> or that one. <laughs> Does anyone know what this is from? Really? Nobody? It's from airplane. Yeah, the quote is... Uh, so, so essentially, the, the captain is on hold with, uh, with the Mayo Clinic, and then the operator comes in, and, he sa- and they say, well, I've got ham on five. He's like, okay, well, give me ham on five and hold the mayo. And it, this is the doctor in the Mayo Clinic with all the, all the mayonnaise behind him. All right. And here's, a qu- here's another question for you. So what did Dr. William Horrell Mayo commonly refer to his children as? Does anybody know? You don't have to answer that. Please do no, not answer that. No, please not engagement's answer, appropriate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> because you. it's Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> because he had five kids, three daughters and two sons. Again, thank you. Yeah, you're uh, welcome. We probably helpful. have time for one more question. If not, we'll do our outro. But does anyone else have any other questions about adenopathy? Sure. I need to follow that transferring or referring over to hematology. So the specific question is, is when do we refer, refer these patients with adenopathy to, to hematology? Uh, when you need our help, basically. So oh. <laughs> oftentimes it is after you have a biopsy and a diagnosis has been made. That would be the most common scenario. But there are times when it gets um, a little bit tricky, where let's say you have a patient with fever of unknown origin and you're doing a workup and it's, you know, rheumatology and ID and hematology are involved with really helping guide what are the next steps in working up the patient. That would be very appropriate as well. Or in other common scenarios, well, um, we have a needle biopsy that's suspicious but not diagnostic for lymphoma. Um, What are the next steps in testing? And and that would be very appropriate to have the patient come see us in hematology. All right. Well, unless there's any, like, other really burning questions, I think we'll do our outro, and then we can hang around afterwards uh, for any, any further. So, Paul, would you do the honors? Please do, Paul. Sure. Happy to. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Great. Yep. <laughs> Understated. Yeah. Dignified. No. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right, because we're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our producer for this specific episode, the one and only Matt Watto. And to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs, Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris, the Chu Manchu on Facebook. Until next time, I've been, and still have been, and will always be, Stuart Kent Brigham. Thank, thank goodness for that, Stuart. Yeah. And thank you for composing our, our wonderful theme music, which You're very is welcome. playing uh, over my voice right now, at least uh, when, this, when this airs. Thanks to Claire Morgan at Notterly for editing our audio. Until next time, I've been Matthew Frank Watto. I'd like to say thank you to the Internal Medicine Chief Residents for the opportunity, Dr. Sammy Ryan, Courtney Harris, Brandon Huffman, Jason Ekman, and their program director, Dr. Amy Oxentanko, who is my former Internal Medicine Chief Resident. And our main Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, thank you and goodbye. When you hear the term cat scan, do you just smile? (laughs) Cat scan. (laughs) (laughs) 